Good morning, everybody. It's chess time. It's always chess time, but especially now is chess time. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our last Isolated Queen Pawn video. Uh, this is going to be sort of a complete roundup of all the concepts that we've looked over for the past month or so. Um, it would behoove you, if you're just starting the series, to try to go through the videos in order to try to get the concepts together. You can go through them piecemeal if necessary, um, but you would get the most out of them by going in order because the concepts sort of interconnect with one another. But here, we're just going to do sort of a verbal wrap-up just to sort of uh, reinforce and reiterate what we went over. Um, first, I'll go over the concepts of playing with the isolated pawn. The most important, I would say the most important concept of playing with an isolated pawn is the advance of the isolated pawn. So this is one of the first examples we looked at, which was Benjamin Grant's. Uh, this is a common position in theory. So actually a lot of strong players for black have fallen into this. Black just played b5, which isn't terribly good. Um, d5. Whenever you can, push the isolated pawn and break the position open. That needs to be on your radar as the first possibility to analyze. Uh, pawn breaks. I've discussed these before, but anytime you can bring a pawn in contact with another pawn, an enemy pawn, that's called a pawn break, and that's sort of the engine and the lever for all of your activity in a position. Uh, with the isolated pawn, uh, breaking the position open by advancing it should be the first, absolute first thing you look at at all times. Now, sometimes it's not appropriate. Um, in this particular position, it is. Um, I would say in the isolated queen pawn structures, it's near, nearly always at least equal for the side with the isolated pawn. At worst, it tends to just liquidate to a completely drawn ending. Um, but a lot of times it is a very favorable possibility. So if you're playing with the isolated pawn, the first order of operations is to analyze whether d4, d5 is profitable, or if you're black, d5, d4. Um, so to, to the contrary, if you're playing against the isolated pawn, controlling the square in front of the isolated pawn is your most important task. You want to prevent that break from happening to begin with. Now, sometimes this leads to just a favorable ending. So, in this particular position, um, it just leads to sort of a uh, um, favorable, simplified position. Um, in another instance, this is one of the second examples we looked at. This is Smyslov Karpov. Um, he, here, uh, Smyslov didn't find it, but this is a common position opening theory, so remember this. Here, d5 leads to a direct mating attack. Bishop g5. 94 is mandatory. But white has a decisive attack here. This is going to be major, major uh, loss of material uh, for black. But the engine of all of this is the pawn break, d4, d5. Always look to your pawn breaks for activity. They are the engine and the lever and the wellspring for most of your dynamism in your position. In an isolated pawn structure, the only pawn break is that d4, d5 push. So, in a way, with the isolated pawn, you control the only uh, pawn break in the position. That gives you quite a bit of control over the position. So, uh, first order of operations, always look to see whether d4, d5 is possible. Playing against the isolated pawn, make sure d4, d5 is not possible. Once d4, d5 is controlled, that's when white starts sort of a classical kingside maneuvering spree to try to generate weaknesses on the kingside. So this is one of the other examples we looked at, which is uh, Romanishin Lyubievich. Um, this mating battery of uh, bishop on the b1 h7 diagonal with the queen in front, uh, that is a key maneuver in these isolated queen pawn positions. You want to establish that battery to try to generate weaknesses on the king side. Typically, if you have the isolated pawn and you can't establish that attacking battery, your chances noticeably go down. Uh, you're much less likely to generate weaknesses on the king side and much less, much less able to make progress on the king side. When you're playing with the isolated pawn, the main goal is to generate aggressive chances against the enemy king. First step in that usually, or the main step, is generating that mating attack battery to generate weaknesses on the king side. And we see Romanishin. Once G your goal is to encourage g6 with this mating battery. Once you do that, the bishop doesn't really belong in that diagonal anymore. The natural diagonal for that light square bishop is the a2, g8 diagonal. So once you encourage g6, a lot of times the bishop will just hop right back to its natural diagonal, and then white will continue. You can see white's 
beautifully developed here. Uh, this is another example of where white missed d5. d5 would be the best move here, but he just continues with the kingside attack. And in isolated pawns, so often, a successful attack is just going to end with a shower of just devastating sacrifices. So here, knight xg6, and then bishop xg6, and this is a winning attack for Romanishen. This isn't a tactical accident. This is part of the heart and soul of the position. It's part of the blood and the flesh of the position. Uh, these sacrifices are what you want to be on the lookout for once you have all your pieces mobilized in, against the uh, enemy king side, especially if you've encouraged a pawn move weakness on that king side. That's when you start looking for those sacrifices to break open the position and go after the enemy king. Um, one of the key maneuvers in a king side attack, again, this is after we've discovered that d4, d5 isn't an option. We start maneuvering for the king side attack. One of the key maneuvers is the rook lift to the third rank. Uh, this is one of the games we looked at, Tukmakov, Korchnoi. Uh, that rook coming to the third rank, that rook is able to hop to g3 or h3. Uh, this is a very dangerous attacking maneuver, especially to defend against. Um, it's viable when the other side really has not generated sufficient counterplay of his or her own. Uh, that's when that rook is able to take that time to hop over to the king side and start blasting away. Um, if the other side has generated counterplay, um, it typically means the isolated queen pawn doesn't have the time to make that maneuver, um, or it comes at too great of a cost. But it, here in this position, uh, Korshoi is fairly passive, so rook d3 doesn't have a cost. So white's just able to build up the king side attack at leisure. In so many of these positions, that rook lift to the third rank is devastating. If the isolated queen pawn position is able to pull that off, that addition of that big attacking material to the king side is just devastating. And, uh, here it was completely devastating. Here Tukmakov missed a direct knockout. And white, white's invading the king side, and this is already uh, pretty much over. So uh, that maneuver of the rook to the third rank is incredibly dangerous in so many of these isolated queen pawn positions. So at if you can't accomplish d4, d5, and you're building up for a kingside attack, um, that's when you start building for a kingside attack, and that maneuver of the rook to the third rank is often a basic tool in that build. Um, so that's playing with the isolated pawn. Let's review the concepts of how to play against. Um, this is one of the model games we looked at uh, in the very beginning, uh, Floor Copper Blanca. This ended up being a draw. Um, but I still think it's a completely model game for how to play against the isolated queen pawn. Four. Um, this is basically as good as it gets against the isolated pawn. The fact that Campo Blanca drew this is mostly down to the fact that he's Campo Blanca. If you get a position like this against the isolated pawn, you're extraordinarily happy. The first order of operations against the isolated pawn is start to neutralize the attacking pieces, get pieces off the board. The pieces you really want off the board are the minor pieces, especially the color the bishop opposite the color of the isolated pawn. So since white's playing against the isolated pawn here, the really dangerous piece for black would have been the dark squared bishop. That would be the bishop aiming directly at the king side. That would be the bishop making a mating battery possible with, say, a bishop on c7 and a queen on d6. Neutralizing minor pieces when playing against an isolated pawn is incredibly important. Typically, you want to leave a couple of major pieces on the board. Uh, at least two, I would say. If you can leave uh, two rooks and a queen, fantastic. The ideal is that you want to put all of your rooks and queens lined up against the isolated pawn and just start to bombard and maneuver to win it. Um, this is still an uh, ideal position for a white. Uh, I think Floor went a little bit wrong here by letting the rooks come off the board too easily. Uh, but even this position here, this is an ideal position against the isolated pawn. Uh, practically, you're going to win a lot of games with a position like this. You know, you've got the bad bishop against the incredibly well-placed knight. Capablanca had to play perfectly to draw this position. If you get a position like this, you're going to win more than your share of points. Um, another model game that we looked at, this is uh, Rubenstein against... Uh, he was black against Rigodzinski. Um Forces the isolated queen pawn weakness... Uh, notice how this is a model position for black. Uh, he's been able to develop his light-squared bishop 
on the, that beautiful long diagonal for no cost. He has perfect control of the d5 square. Um, and white doesn't really have any pressure against the king side just yet. Um, and Rubenstein just builds this easily. Uh, conceptually, knight e4 here is a bad choice because it is trading minor pieces off the board. When you're playing against the isolated pawn, you want to get those minor pieces off the board. So black is happy to see this. And this, this is an absolute perfect position for, for black, for Rubenstein. This is... Uh, the ideal of what you want against the isolated pawn. We've gotten three sets of minor pieces off the board, so there's really not much of a chance of a successful kingside attack. Uh, now we can just maneuver against the weakness on d4. To reiterate, the principle of two weaknesses comes off a lot in endings. Uh, when playing against the isolated pawn, typically the weakness of the isolated pawn isn't enough. When You'll also be maneuvering to create another weakness. So here, Rubenstein maneuvers to create another weakness, and he's successful in doing this by invoking b3 from white. Um, and that was more than enough for, for Rubenstein to convert. Um, so that ideal of uh, leaving major pieces on the board to face the ice of the pawn, uh, a good example of that was another game we looked at with Spadevsky, uh, Blastomo Forts. Just notice how black maneuvers his pieces into perfect position. This here is the ideal of what you want to set up against the ice of the pawn. So we've gotten three sets of minor pieces off the board. That's tremendous gain when fighting the ice of the pawn. Uh, Black's got two rooks in front and the queen in behind. This setup is called a Luckin's gun. And this is exactly the setup you want. It's most powerful. If you leave with the queen, you're not going to be able to actually take it because you'll be losing your queen for a rook. So you have the two rooks in front first, then the queen behind. Uh, that's the correct technique to set up an attack against the ice of the pawn. That's the ideal arrangement of what you want against the ice of pawn, and Port went on to convert from here. Um, and then the final uh, concept I wanted to review, we'll be reviewing hanging pawns coming up here soon, uh, probably as soon as tomorrow. Um, but one technique playing against the ice of pawn, which I didn't want to go into too much detail since it'll have its own section, but when you're playing against the ice of pawn, one possible technique is to transition to hanging pawns at the appropriate moment. So here, this is uh, Karas Kapoblaka, uh, Euro 1938, legendary format, legendary game, legendary players. Um, white chooses to transition to uh, hanging pawns, and here it's completely perfect. Because he is in time to play c4 and stop c5 from the other side. If he just waited one more move, the hanging pawns can advance abreast of one another so they can support a further advance. So if, say, c4 is played here, then d4, and black is more than fine, probably. Uh, but on c4, black isn't in time to play c5, so these hanging pawns just end up being weak. Uh, so timing when to transition to a hanging pawn, it takes a lot of positional judgment, um, but it's often a very effective technique against the ice of the pawn. Um, so this was our final review. Uh, thank you so very much for watching the series so far. We're going to be moving on to Hanging Pawns tomorrow. Uh, my name is John. I will talk to you later.